Welcome to the second of two special end-of-year episodes of GM Word of the Week. If you missed the first one, check last week's releases. Each month we make a bonus episode of the show for our $10 supporters on Patreon. These episodes usually focus on some unique aspect of one of the previous month's episodes that either didn't fit with the main topic of the show, or were so interesting that we'd have detoured the entire show to tackle them. So instead, we set them aside for use as bonus episode fodder, and called those extra episodes footnotes, as in a footnote to whatever episode first brought them to our attention. Now normally there's always a bit of a to-do around the end of the year and the holiday season that, in the past, meant it was easier for us just to take the last few weeks of the year off rather than try to write, record, and produce a fresh, new, tasty episode. What with travel and family obligations, it was just too tight a schedule to try to put one out. And that's what we were prepared to do this year as well, just lay off the last two weeks of this year and start prepping for next. But then we thought, hang on, we've got some really cool stuff no one has really heard yet outside of our patrons. Why don't we bundle them up for two end-of-the-year specials and release them to the public? And since we couldn't think of a really good reason not to, that's what we did. Each of these holiday specials runs a little short of an hour apiece. Some are informative, some are stories, and some are just letting you know about additional bits of the stories we've covered throughout the year. All of them are entertaining, though, and we hope you enjoy them. Oh, and if they are something you want more of on a regular basis, head over to gmwordoftheweek.com and click the yellow banner at the top to join our Patreon. Happy Holidays! See you next year! Hey, remember last month when we were talking about peritons and I said this? And in 1998, astronomers using a 200-foot radio telescope at Parkes Observatory in New South Wales, Australia, detected the first periton. And they continued to detect them until 2015. And for 18 years... Radio astronomers and engineers at Park Observatory were trying to figure out what the heck was causing these weird signals. They went all over the equipment, scanned everywhere for rogue radio signals that they might be picking up. They did everything. And then, in 2015, they finally found the source of the mysterious signal. It turned out that, like gamers... Astronomers couldn't wait for their snacks. See, in the employee cafeteria, there was a microwave. I couldn't help but wonder, what the heck took them so long? Eighteen years seems like a very long time. Entire careers in astronomy can come and go in that time. What was the big hang-up? So I went and looked. Sure enough, I found the actual paper that was filed by Petrov, Keen, Barr... Reynolds, Sarkissian, Edwards, Stevens, Brem, Jameson, Burke, Spillor, Johnstone, Bott, Chandra, Kuldale, and Bandari. That's right. Scientists and researchers from all over Australia, the United Kingdom, the USA, and India. Think about that for a minute. 18 years, 15 scientists, 4 countries. All to find out that some folks are impatient when it comes to microwaving their food. Well, rather than retelling you the story from the episode, which you can just go listen to again, I'll recap and summarize and then tell you why it mattered so much. It's all about FRB 010724. Our in-episode summary about the situation at the Parks Radio Telescope left out one very important detail. And that detail is FRB 010724, better known as the Lorimer Burst. FRB stands for Fast Radio Burst. It is a millisecond, or even fractional millisecond, burst of energy with no explained origin that occurs somewhere out in extragalactic space, that is, space outside our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Something sent out this extremely brief signal for reasons we don't know yet, and a radio telescope in Australia picked it up. Only in looking back at the recorded data does Duncan Lorimer and his associate David Narkivik notice that something odd has happened. 
This isn't like they heard a blip and went looking. This is them deciding to look at data in a different way than usual, and then spotting that indeed, something interesting did happen at a previous point in time. And it's important because the Lorimer Burst is the very first FRB ever found. And it's a problem because it's the only such signal found. There is no repetition, no pattern to look for, no additional information. It's one of a kind. And no one is convinced it's real. In science, you must be able to repeat things or to have multiple observations of the same thing. You have to be able to back up your claims. And this is an even bigger problem because someone or several someones at the Park Observatory don't know how to use a microwave properly. So in with this data that may or not be the very first FRB ever seen is all this other data that looks remarkably like it and no one else can explain either. And they know this other data is bad data. It makes the whole FRB thing look like a mistake. And they know the data is bad because, as the paper explains, the signals are seen over a wide field of view, suggesting that they are in the near field rather than boresight astronomical sources. In other words, they aren't coming from where the radio telescope is aimed, but from somewhere closer in. The paper goes on, the signals are very short, not of the expected duration. And as the final nail in the data coffin, the majority of the 46 peritons detected were detected during weekday office hours. But they look so much like an FRB, or it looks like them, that no one is willing to confirm that an actual FRB has been found. It might only be another periton occurring at an off time. So they have to find out what is causing the peritons in order to actually advance science. That's what's at stake. So these 15 scientists and researchers start trying to narrow things down. They work out the frequency of the burst, about 2.3 to 2.5 gigahertz. They monitor the environment around the radio telescope looking for radio frequency interference, basically noise from anything electronic in the radio band that might match. They get another radio telescope in a different part of Australia 400 kilometers away to monitor them as a backup. Eventually, they even get the giant meter wave telescope in India to watch the same patch of sky they are watching. And when a periton occurs at Park, the GMT sees nothing. Meanwhile, other places are now looking for fast radio bursts in their data, and they find them, quite a few. But Lorimer's is the first, if they can prove it's real. So now they know that the peritons are from a local source, probably quite local. The frequency these peritons come in on is the same set of frequencies that Australia Communications Authority allocates for devices such as medical equipment, wireless internet usage, and microwave ovens. They put together a chart of the time frequency occurrence of the signals, and you can look at the chart and see that it has one big peak, a peak at about 12.30 p.m. lunchtime. But the problem is, they can't replicate the results. They think it's a piece of malfunctioning equipment. They even think they know it's related to at least one of the three on-site microwave ovens in employee lunchrooms. They spend time working out that it can only occur when the telescope is looking at a particular piece of sky and so is exposed in a particular way to one or the other of these microwaves. They've almost got it, but they can't repeat it. And as we said earlier, if you can't repeat it, it's no good. They try everything and can't generate another periton. Until the 17th of March, 2015. At that point, someone decides to use a microwave just like everyone else does, without paying any attention to the warning to let the microwave completely stop before opening the door. And sure enough, as the magnetron inside the microwave, the part that generates the radiation energy that cooks the food, swiftly came to a stop when the door was opened from full power. Three peritons were generated, escaped the otherwise perfectly safe microwave, and were observed on the telescope. And they can repeat it. 
Mystery solved. Lorimer Burst FRB010724 is validated. History is made. Science advances. The answer to the question, what took so long, is that the stakes involved demanded such a high level of thoroughness and confidence in the final results, results that could leave no doubts whatsoever about the nature of FRB010724, that going faster just wasn't an option. At least the blame for the problem could be shared among many people going about the course of their day. Not like the case of potassium flares at Francis Haute Provence Observatory in 1967. Three stars being observed via spectrograph, the analysis of light from a star through special filters that reveal its chemical makeup, three stars suddenly and inexplicably showed very bright flare-ups in the potassium band. Turns out, one of the astronomers in the room just wanted a nice relaxing smoke while on duty. And matches are full of potassium. You'll no doubt recall that when we talked about shellac in May, we not only discussed how the stuff was made and how it was used, but we also talked about the lac bug from which shellac is derived. They're fascinating little beasties which, on the one hand, are terrible pests, but on the other, produce some of the most useful stuff in the world. It's hard to know whether to wipe them out or farm them when you compare how destructive they are to fruit tree crops with how profitable they can be if left alone. Lac bugs belong to a family of insects known as scale insects. As we explained in the episode, scale insects group together on a plant's branch or leaf and hunker down for a long feed, until there are so many of them it sort of looks like the plant is wearing a suit of armor. And they kill the harvest. The entire scientific family of which is called Cocoidea. And you're a smart regular listener of the show if you just asked yourself, well, what else is in the family Cocoidea? Like we did. Turns out, it's full of oddly annoying but useful little bugs that we as humans make regular use of in some capacity. None more so, perhaps, than the little bug called cochineal. But first, a tiny bit of history. If you recall our episode about purple, you may remember we spoke about Tyrian purple, which was derived from a particular kind of snail found off the island of Tyr. We talked about how important this color was about how its use was mostly reserved for royalty, making it one of the ways you could tell who was in charge around the place. Eventually, though, its use faded out, even though one of the reasons it was such an important color was because it didn't fade. Tyrian purple gradually lost its place of prominence to a new up-and-coming color, scarlet. Well, you'll be happy to know it was the cochineal bug that was responsible for that color. By at least the 2nd century BCE, the Aztec and Mayan peoples had been picking the small bugs off the prickly pear cactus on which they lived, crushing them, and then using the bright red liquid that resulted as a colorant. By the 15th century, after Montezuma had conquered about a dozen cities in South America, part of his yearly tribute included 40 bags of cochineal dye each. Of course, the 16th century brought the Spanish conquistadors, and by the 17th century, cochineal dye was being exported as far away as India. This was great news for Mexico. They had a virtual monopoly on cochineal production. The bug didn't really live anywhere else in spite of efforts in the 1700s to smuggle the little guys out of the country and establish them elsewhere. They just didn't take. So Mexico was pretty much able to charge whatever they wanted for the now in high demand dye. It wouldn't be until the Mexican War of Independence and the change in territories that brought about in the early 1800s that anyone else even got a look in at the cochineal industry. Of course, by then, the industry didn't have much longer to survive as a money-making prospect. By 1869, someone figured out how to make a color called alizarin crimson. It was an artificial color derived from the matter plant, and it was much easier to make in greater quantities in less time and with less effort than cochineal. 
It wasn't long before alizarin crimson was the go-to choice and had nearly shut down the entire cochineal industry. But before we wave goodbye to the cochineal bug and scale insects, let's talk about some of those words we used back there. Crimson and scarlet in particular. To start with, the word cochineal itself comes through French and Spanish from the Latin word coconus, which meant nothing more than scarlet colored. And if you're wondering how Latin had a word for scarlet before scarlet really existed, relax. There were lots of reds in the world prior to the cochineal bug's contribution, just none as vibrant and color fast, which made it easy for medieval Latin scarlata to be stolen from Persian sakalat, which just meant any rich cloth. Basically, the Latin word didn't mean the color necessarily so much as it did the cloth which was often a variety of colors. What color is this, you might ask? To be answered, why it's kind of a similar color to that one on that fancy sack a lot over there. Crimson, on the other hand, is a little more direct. The word comes from, ultimately, the Arabic word kermizi, which meant, and we know you'll be terribly surprised to learn this, the kermes bug. Yet another member of the Cocoidea family of insects noted for producing a vibrant red color when crushed. Neat, huh? Fortunately, cochineal is making a sort of comeback. It has become profitable again to make cochineal dye thanks to, in part, health concerns brought about by artificial red dyes. See, one of the many things dyes get used for is as a food coloring. Some foods, both natural and artificial foods, just don't look very appetizing when presented as they naturally are. Grays and browns are always a problem, for instance. So what happened was, food manufacturers and processors were looking for ways to make their foods appear more appetizing, more pleasing to the eye, so they started adding colors to them to help. Well, as it turns out, not a lot of research was available or even encouraged in the early days of food manufacture. So some of the things added to foods turned out not to be all that good for you, especially the reds. Many, many artificial reds turned out under laboratory testing to be carcinogens, capable of causing cancer, which many, many people dislike having as an additional property of their food. The solution? A return to natural dyes like cochineal. At least, natural in the sense that they occur in nature rather than being manufactured. Now, of course, you can find cochineal in any number of places. Besides food and cloth coloring, it is used in the staining of laboratory specimens for better viewing. It can be found in lipstick and other cosmetics, marinades, alcoholic drinks, jams, cookies, sauces, and certain varieties of cheese. Basically, anything that looks red stands a better than even chance of having cochineal added as a dye if it doesn't naturally occur red. Even your various red pills and ointments can contain cochineal extract or carmine. Both mean the same thing. You'll no doubt recall the episode from October about cursed paintings. In it, we talked about several paintings rumored to be haunted. Notably, we focused on The Hands Resist Him by William Stoneham in the first half of the episode, and on the picture of Dorian Gray in the second half, and mentioned another half dozen or so haunted paintings and video games featuring what can only be described as possessed paintings. But in all our discussion about the various paintings and games and why one of us thought of totally different things than the other, we didn't really cover one very important element that often goes hand in hand with reports of haunted paintings. The eyes that seem to follow you around the room. You've seen it before. Scooby-Doo is forever being looked at by creepy paintings with eyes that really do follow him around the room because there's a real person doing the looking. They always write it off as just another scary old painting because even Team Scooby can get a bit jaded and complacent when house after house is filled to the ceiling with artwork painted by someone who was well off their meds at the time. But there really are paintings with eyes that really do look like they are following you around the room. The most famous example is, of course, La Gioconda, or the Mona Lisa. If somehow, impossibly, you don't know what that is, I'd like to congratulate you on avoiding the single most famous piece of art ever created, 
bar none. That's some real dedication you've shown to knowing literally nothing about art of any sort. But in case you do exist, the Mona Lisa is a half-length portrait painted by Leonardo da Vinci in the early 1500s of a noble woman with an enigmatic smile upon her face. It is a genuine tour de force of da Vinci's painting prowess and hangs in the Louvre, as it has done practically every day since the late 1700s. Barring a few random thefts. And a war, too. Okay, and a trip to Japan. And the USA. Okay, look, if you want to see the painting yourself, it's usually in the Louvre. Fairly regularly. It is famed for not only the subject matter's intriguing expression, but also for the excellence of the landscape behind the subject, the overall composition of the piece, and the use of light and shadow. And it's that last one that gives us the clue to how some paintings seem to follow you around the room with their eyes. The thing is, paintings are, by their nature, two-dimensional. So two-dimensional are they, that no one really worked out how to make the subjects of the painting seem anything other than two-dimensionally flat until the 14th century. Up to that point, the way you made something seem closer or further from the viewer was to move it up and down the painting and paint it bigger or smaller. It was okay, and sort of worked, but mostly it just looked like a big guy and a small guy standing next to each other with the small guy sort of floating in space there. It wasn't very convincing. There was no expression of depth. Then along comes a fellow by the name of Filippo Brunelleschi. He's an artist and an architect, and he's working on things like the Florentine Cathedral when he starts studying the ancient ruins of Rome. Well, considerably less ancient at that time, but you get my meaning. He starts poking around and measuring things, and being an architect and an artist, it suddenly dawns on him how the whole mathematical aspect of art and perspective works, and then boom, something called linear perspective is born. Filippio sets up a frame containing a grid in the middle, and a sort of eyepiece on one end. He points the other end at various buildings, and paints, grid space by grid space, exactly what he sees. So good are the results that he tests them by placing one of his paintings next to a mirror reflecting the building in question. And people genuinely have a hard time deciding which is the painting of the building, and which is the reflection. It's not long before other folks notice Brunelleschi's work, among them da Vinci himself. And Leonardo is no slouch either. He begins refining the technique and improving upon it. It's not long before people are adding shading and highlighting and other techniques to really begin painting in a wholly different manner, a more realistic manner. And now we're back to the Mona Lisa. She's very realistically painted. The whole painting is even the things in the background. And the thing we mentioned before, the use of light and shadow, combined with Brunelleschi's linear perspective and improved and refined by the skill of Leonardo, gives us a Mona Lisa whose eyes can follow us around the room. Because while the painting is two-dimensional, the figure in it appears to us to be three-dimensional. And what da Vinci did and what every other artist who paints a painting does when making eyes that follow you around the room, was to paint the eyes looking straight out of the painting at an observer standing right in front of the painting. When viewed from directly in front, the perspective and the lights and the shadows give us a proper view of the subject, a fully three-dimensional view of something that only exists in two dimensions. So your brain goes, oh yeah, that's a real thing, those things in that painting. And so they operate by the rules of real things. And if I move over here, the lights and shadows will shift. Hey, wait a minute, that's not behaving right. And the eyes of the painting continue to look directly at you because that's the way they were painted and they cannot change. They don't behave by the rules of 3D objects, no matter how much your brain wants them to. So they appear to follow you around the room, because in order for those highlights and shadows to remain the same, 
your brain says the whole thing has to rotate, the lighting along with it, in order for that to continue to be true. It's quite literally 500 years before this technique is improved upon in the 19th century. That's how good the results are. And it isn't until sometime around 2004 that professor of psychology James Todd from Ohio State University, working in conjunction with the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands, finally put it all together and explained why the eyes follow you. It's just a trick your brain plays on you because it doesn't know how to handle the unblinking stare coming from a two-dimensional figure trying to convince you it exists in three-dimensional space and is just as real as you. And that's not creepy at all. Last month, we talked about quite a few things. The transition from rowing to sailing to steam power, the development of the calendar, lenses and spectacles, and tornadoes. And it's that last one in particular we want to revisit. Not because there was anything wrong with it, but because we had to leave so much out of it that would be absolutely brilliant for your game. In the name of concise discussion about what tornadoes are, how they form, and how long it really took people to start understanding them scientifically. Take, for instance, the variety of tornadoes one can encounter. Typically, everyone thinks of tornadoes as those big black spinny cloud things we talked about in the original episode. You know, the going to Oz kind. The really fascinating bit about tornadoes isn't all about those sorts, though. They're about the odd and oftentimes even more dangerous spin-offs of tornadoes. See what we did there? Let's start small. We're willing to bet most of you have heard of dust devils. These are the fun little tornadoes you sometimes see on hot days in the afternoons. They're little spinning clouds of dust and debris which are completely harmless, though sometimes they get dirt in your eye. Except, they aren't really tornadoes, of course. They're classified as whirlwinds, and we just know what your next question is going to be. What's the difference? Well, it's a matter of classification and formation, mostly. Whirlwinds fall into two main types, lesser whirlwinds and greater whirlwinds. Greater whirlwinds are tornadoes and their relatives. They form as part of a storm and are generally much more powerful and destructive than their lesser cousins. They last longer and are very difficult to interrupt or stop. Lesser whirlwinds encompass dust devils in their ilk and are created by the movement of local air along the ground. They tend to travel with the air that formed them, and they are less powerful and dangerous, though this is not always the case, as some dust devils have been recorded at more than 10 meters wide and 1,000 meters tall, sufficient to do damage to property and harm to people, though not on the scale of a tornado. Also, they're very easy to disrupt, often running out of steam as soon as they encounter any obstacle and the winds that drive them dissipate. So there's that explained. Speaking of steam... The steam devil is an extremely rare phenomena that occurs over water when warm water and cold air meet. If the spinning air meets with fog, the fog is taken up in the air funnel making it visible. They seem to pirouette gently and slowly as they move around, and most only last a couple of minutes at best. The few known and recorded occurrences of a steam devil have happened over the Great Lakes and off the coast of the Carolinas, as cold air from inland meets the warm Gulf Stream waters though it is possible to see them almost every day at the larger hot springs in Yellowstone, where steam hangs in the air on cold mornings. Steam devils are, of course, the smaller cousins of water spouts, which is what happens when a tornado forms at sea. Well, not exactly. See, a tornado requires a supercell storm to really get rolling, but the water spout once again forms because of the interaction of different temperatures of air and water. They tend to be more powerful than steam devils, but less powerful than actual tornadoes. And they don't really suck up water, they can occur over any large body of water, either inland or at sea, and very few fish actually go for a ride on them. Frankly, it's all a bit confusing with a water spout. Some do develop like tornadoes over water, with the whole supercell storm and everything. Others don't, but all of them are less powerful than a regular tornado even the ones that form over land and are called land spouts, which are water spouts on land and not tornadoes over water, even though it is perfectly acceptable to call the ones over water tornadoes over water. 
Clearly, science still has some work to do. Basically, water spouts and land spouts both require at least some cloud formation above them. Whereas true tornadoes, to be called tornadoes and not land spouts, require a mesocyclone formation to spawn them. All clear? Good, because we're not going over it again. Finally, let's dig into a kind of whirlwind that is potentially even more frightening than an actual tornado ever could be. The fire whirl. Yes, it's just as bad as you imagine. The heat and air movement generated by large fires already causes them to create their own local weather conditions, and when a rising column of air begins to spin, hot coals and ash are taken up with them. If sufficient fuel exists within the spinning column of air, it can ignite, setting the whole column burning. In other cases, the rising air column pulls flames up with it, which then ignites other debris in the updraft. If there was ever a case to be made for fire elementals being real, this would be it. But that's not all. The winds in a fire whirl have been recorded at up to F3 on the Fujita scale, enough to be classified as a Rilio Trulio tornado all on its own. And they don't even have to have the mesocyclone above them to drive them on, being powered by the wildfire raging below. How bad can it get? In 2003, in Canberra, Australia, a massive bushfire broke out. During the conflagration, a massive fire whirl was recorded with horizontal winds of up to 160 miles per hour and a vertical airspeed approaching 100 miles per hour. And then it got even worse. Flashover is the temperature at which normal materials will spontaneously combust over a wide area. Generally, it occurs around 500 to 590 degrees Fahrenheit, setting everything alight in an instant. The Canberra fire whirl caused a 300-acre flashover in about four one-hundredths of a second. Literally, boom fire. A fire whirl in 2018 during the car fire in California, which we, your erstwhile host, received no small amount of smoke from, generated a full tornado-style fire whirl that made its own mesocyclone and supercell, uprooting trees, tossing cars, and generating even more structural damage in addition to the spreading fire. Imagine throwing that at your players. Last month, we followed up our episode on the cow with three further episodes on butter, cheese, and milk, some of the main products of the cow. However, you'd be forgiven for thinking we forgot one of the other main products of the cow and frequent resident of the dairy case at your local supermarket. But not so, say we. We didn't forget it at all. No, sir. Instead, we saved it for later. Right now, in fact. This bonus episode is all about yogurt. Yogurt, like many of its dairy shelf neighbors, was probably created completely by accident and so many years ago that its true origin is lost. It's a similar story in other ways, too. Goatskin bags of milk come in contact with a particular combination of bacteria, in this case Lactobacillus delbruchii, subspecies Bulgaricus, and Streptococcus thermophilus. Various reactions take place, time passes, and surprise, surprise, the goatskin bags are now full of a sour-tasting gelatinous thing that needs a new name. So the Mesopotamians, where it seems to have originated about 5,000 years ago, gave it one. We don't know what that original name was, but today we know it by its Turkish name, yogurt. Once again, the bacteria in question are fermenting the lactose, or milk sugars, into lactic acid. The difference in the process, though, is the application of heat. The milk is heated to 181 degrees Fahrenheit, enough to scald it. This causes proteins in the milk to unravel, destroys various milk enzymes, and kills any bacteria, preparing the way for the proper bacteria to be added once the milk is cooled down again, so that they can go about their business uninterrupted. Once that's underway, you warm the milk to encourage the process and leave it for a few days until it turns thick and sour. And it tastes... Well, to the Western palate, it mostly tastes terrible. Raw yogurt is really very sour indeed, and only gets more sour the longer you leave it. We're not talking about the slightly sour taste of your basic vanilla-flavored yogurt. Even with that modicum of flavoring, there's been a quantity of sugar added along with the vanilla flavor to make it more palatable. No, 
Raw, unsweetened, unflavored yogurt requires more, you just have to get used to it, than most folks are willing to invest in what is basically a blob of spoiled milk. It was such a problem that when yogurt first hit the shelves of U.S. markets in the early years of the 20th century, it didn't do well. Okay, to be fair, this was partly due to the fact that you could get it only as a tablet for home culturing or as a dietary supplement for the euphemistically named condition of dietary intolerance. Which wasn't a bad idea, really, because the bacterial cultures in yogurt, if you eat yogurt with live cultures or probiotic yogurt, have been shown to help those who are lactose intolerant. The little bacteria stick around in your gut and help digest other milk products. Fortunately, John Harvey Kellogg came along and helped popularize yogurt for the general public. You'll recall Kellogg was something of a health nut, in the nuttiest sense of the word. His health sanitarium has become famous for its oddball cures and general air of quackery, but at the time was considered the place to go for a wide variety of health problems. From his work at the sanitarium came products like Kellogg's Corn Flakes, a product designed to be so bland and uninteresting that you wouldn't even begin to think about touching yourself inappropriately, which was seemingly Kellogg's main area of interest. In any case, the sanitarium and Kellogg made yogurt popular among the patients there and subsequently among the general population. Though it is worth noting that Kellogg used plain yogurt in two ways. Let's just say one internally at the top and one internally at the bottom, if you take our meaning. Having survived the terror of the Kellogg method, in 1929 yogurt got a commercial boost from Sarkis and Rose Columbosian. Armenian immigrants who were already familiar with yogurt from their home country. They came to the United States and opened Colombo & Sons Creamery in Massachusetts. Initially, it proved popular with local immigrants from other Near Eastern countries, but still had trouble on the flavor front with most other Americans. In the 1950s, it began being recommended to people again as a healthy food, though thankfully without the full brunt of a Kellogg treatment. Finally, in 1966, Colombo and Sons introduced a flavored sweetened yogurt made with fruit preserves and things really took off as fruit on the bottom yogurt. Not fruit in the bottom, you'll note. Now, there are basically four different versions of yogurt that have gained popularity over the years. You've got your basic yogurt, which we've just outlined. And if you've watched enough of The Good Place, you'll be able to guess one of the others. Froyo or frozen yogurt. Take your basic ice cream recipe and remove the cream. Replace it with regular milk and add in some yogurt bacterial cultures. Voila, you've got frozen yogurt. It's lower in fat than regular ice cream and, unlike ice cream and yogurt, completely unregulated by the United States Food and Drug Administration. Although some states are a little bit more picky. And from that, an entire 80s and 90s food fad was born. Go figure. And while we're on the subject of food fads, let's talk about the third version of yogurt on our playlist, kefir. It comes originally from Russia and surrounding countries, and although technically not yogurt, it's close enough to being yogurt that you can label it that way. Kefir is a thin yogurt-like milk drink made by inoculating milk with kefir grains. And if, like us, you didn't know there was such a thing as kefir grains, welcome to the club. Basically, kefir grains are... Well, let's let Wikipedia explain it directly. The kefir grains initiating the fermentation consist of a symbiotic culture of lactic acid bacteria and yeasts embedded in a matrix of proteins, lipids, and polysaccharides. The matrix is formed by microbial activity and resembles small cauliflower grains with color ranging from white to creamy yellow. A complex and highly variable community can be found in these grains, which can include lactic acid bacteria, acetic acid bacteria, and yeasts. While some microbes predominate, lactobacillus species are always present. In case you missed a few key words in that explanation, the ones you want to focus on are complex and highly variable community, which is wiki speak for we don't really understand it all, it's hard to control, and there's a lot of it. Part of the reason for that is because it is symbiotic, which means each part of it relies on each other part of it to function, and these interactions can sometimes be unpredictable. One of the more interesting unpredictabilities is alcohol. Kefir contains alcohol. 
but how much it contains is up for grabs depending on how the kefir grains feel on the day. All kefir contains some alcohol, arising from the fermentation process with the help of the yeast. How much you get, though, can be something of a gamble. More sugar in the mix means more alcohol, but this isn't as well controlled as it might be in, say, brewing beer. So sometimes you get more than you want. Which is why a bunch of kefir manufacturers got in trouble in the mid-2000s for having more than 2% ethanol in some of their products. The other hazard of kefir production is the variety of acids produced by the manufacturing process. They aren't a problem for kefir drinkers usually, provided you've prepared the kefir in the proper containers. The problem begins when you make it in anything other than a non-reactive container. The quantity of acid in your typical batch of kefir can corrode copper, aluminum, and zinc containers, among others, leaching significant amounts of those metals into your kefir. Fortunately, there's nothing at all wrong with our final yogurt-based product, which we're going to pronounce tzatziki, and you can write in to complain about. It's made of salted and either strained or diluted yogurt, with a bit of cucumber, garlic, and olive oil added. Sometimes other stuff. The name tzatziki is a modern Greek word whose root comes from somewhere no one seems to be very sure about. Could be Turkey, could be Persia, could be a bunch of places. What makes it really fun is that all the places it could have come from have very different things to which they refer, all of which fall under the broad umbrella of something which could be referred to as tzatziki if you are willing to stretch the definition. Basically, what we just described to you is the Greek version of the condiment. Or the soup. Or the dip. Depending on where in the world you are when you ask for it. In fact, in Lithuania and some regions of Russia, their traditional borscht is made with kefir. And we'd be hard-pressed to tell you why it isn't just another version of tzatziki, this time with beets. Footnote to Esther. Okay, this one is a bit of a cheat. It doesn't directly relate to any of last month's episodes. In effect, what you have here is the equivalent of those cooking shows on TV. This is one I prepared earlier. If you've been around here a bit, you might even have seen the original of it at some point. But try not to hold it against me. It's not entirely the same. I've added some additional information and expanded it a bit. It happened like this. One day on Twitter, someone asked a question in full view of my own eyes. What they wanted to know was, which came first, Esther the name or Esther the organic chemical? And because I do this sort of show where I answer these sorts of questions and explain things to people, you can perhaps understand what a terrible, terrible temptation that was to me. The answer is easy enough. Esther the name came first, and aside from the name, the two are... Two totally different, unrelated concepts. I could have left it there. Everything would be fine, and people, especially me, could get on with their lives. It's an awful thing to over-answer a question. You know how it is. You ask a simple question, or at least one that seems simple, and the next thing you know, some guy at the back of the room stands up, pushes his glasses back up on his nose, and says, Those two magic words that mean you should buckle in for at least an hour. Well, actually... So I'll try to spare you that, but, well, actually, first, the name Esther. Esther, E-S-T-E-R, is the Spanish, Portuguese, Italian version of the name Esther, E-S-T-H-E-R. It was first used as a given name in Europe and Britain during the Reformation in the 16th century. Prior to that, about the only people who had it as a name were a few saints. For the longest time, it was interchangeable with the name Hester, and there are a further 20 or so variations of that name that are functionally equivalent with it around the world. From Ireland's Elster to Australia's Essie to the English Hetty, they're all the same name with the same roots. President Grover Cleveland named his daughter, who was the first to be born in the White House, Esther, and this saw the name rise to its most popular height of 27th most popular name for American girls in 1896. Second, ester the chemistry term is a chemical compound derived from an acid and an alcohol. It was first coined in 1848 by a German chemist named Gemellen, likely as a contraction of the German word for acetic ether. They get used for all sorts of things, but are also important to something called fatty acid esters, or glycerides, which makes up one of the main classes of lipids and much of animal fats and vegetable oils. 
One of their other more notable functions is smell. Generally speaking, if something has a smell, it's usually because of esters. Bananas, pineapples, and strawberries, for example, owe their pleasant scents to the same ester, ethyl butyrate. Now, clearly, those are two completely unrelated terms, a mere happenstance that they are spelled and pronounced the same. And we've answered the original question, Esther the name came first. By a huge margin, by virtue of existing since well before BC and not, as in the case of the chemical compound, in AD because a German chemist made it up in the 19th century. Thank goodness we can now all nod and move on. Except, to be fair, there is a sort of connection. Let me explain. Esther is perhaps most well known as a name from the Bible, from the Old Testament book of Esther, in fact. See, there was this king, King Ahasuerus, who some people think was King Xerxes I of Persia, who had a wife called Vashti. Vashti was exceedingly beautiful, and the king was apparently in the habit of parading her out as his party piece to show off to all the gathered people, possibly without any of her clothes. Well, one day, Vashti kind of gets tired of it all, and when the king sends for her to come out and display her charms, she says no. Well, kings being kings, they aren't used to being told no. So Ahasuerus gets upset. So upset that he declares her not his queen anymore. And deposed, Vashti leaves the story and catches a lot of heck in subsequent interpretations. Meanwhile, the king is now without a wife, and so he sets about looking for a new one. Now, in the Empire of Persia, which is, believe it or not, famously tolerant of different religions, are a group of Jews more or less hiding out and trying to keep being alive. Among them is a man called Mordecai, and he has a niece named, for reasons of hiding out, Esther. Though really, her given name is probably Hadassah. See, there was this practice of renaming the Jews in relation to the gods of other traditions, which is why Mordecai is a Babylonian name meaning servant of Marduk, and Esther is thought to come from Mesopotamian Ishtar, which is a terrible movie. Anyway, as these things go, the king spots Esther, decides she is even more beautiful than Vashti ever was, and marries her. Meanwhile, Mordecai overhears a plot to assassinate the king and tells him about it. The king has the plotters arrested and hanged, and Mordecai goes down in the king's little black book as a really good guy. Things are pretty okay for a while, except that one day the king's newly appointed advisor, Haman, goes for a stroll, and Mordecai, being Jewish, refuses to bow down to him, which is embarrassing when absolutely everyone else is doing it, but there you go. Haman finds out about Mordecai's Jewishness and decides to do something about it. Except the thing he decides to do is not just punish Mordecai, but to kill every single Jew everywhere in the Persian Empire. All of them. Some might consider that a bit of an overreaction. But some money changes hands, the king approves of the plan, and doesn't really realize who all this would involve. And a date is set, right about the 13th of March. Mordecai hears about this and begs Esther, who is now queen, remember, to do something to stop all the madness. So Esther fasts for a few days leading up to the date of execution and convinces the king and Haman to join her, at which point she then asks them both to a feast the next day. They agree, but Haman also takes a little time out to build a gallows just for Mordecai, probably even chiseled his name in it too, you know, the personal touch. Now here comes the funny part. The king still hasn't worked out that Esther and Mordecai are Jewish, and so are scheduled to die by his own royal decree. She hasn't told him, and Mordecai doesn't get to the palace that often. But that night, between feasts, the king can't sleep. He's having so much trouble sleeping that he decides to have the court records read out to him because very few things could be more boring than being told what you'd already done as a matter of routine business. Meanwhile, Haman finishes the gallows and trots off to the king to get permission to put them to use right away, if not sooner. He's really got it in for Mordecai. He walks in on the king, just as the king has reached the bit of the royal records where he wrote down Mordecai's name and realizes he never properly rewarded the guy. 
So the king turns to Haman, who has just come in, and says, Hey, Haman, buddy, how would you reward someone if they had done you a great service? I owe the guy, big time. And Haman thinks, pretty much out of nowhere and for no good reason, that the king means to honor him, because what else in the world could the king possibly mean? So Haman says, Hey, kingy baby, dress him up in the finest royal outfits, pop him on a fancy horse or whatever it is we have around here, and parade him through town for everyone to see, while heaping praises upon him and letting everyone know how really, truly amazing he is. And the king says, Ooh, that, that's a good idea. I'm glad you came up with it. Now, go find Mordecai and do everything you just said to him. Can you imagine? The next morning, the king is so generally pleased with the way everything is gone, what with one great feast behind him, Mordecai finally properly taken care of and rewarded, and another feast underway yet again hosted by his beautiful wife, Esther, that he tells her she can have absolutely anything she wants. Anything at all. No, really, anything, just to name it. At which point she says, Well, Kingy, I'm Jewish, and so's Mordecai, and we're about to have a really, really bad day. And it's all thanks to this chump of an advisor you hired, Haman. And the king is so angry and speechless that he walks out of the room. Haman flings himself at Esther, trying to plead for his life, but the king comes back in and sees this and thinks Haman is attacking her. So he orders the man hung immediately on this really convenient set of gallows someone built last night. Weird. Now, the extra fun, exciting part is that the king can't change the royal decree. That's sort of the whole point of royal decrees. Instead, he tacks a bit onto the end of it. And that bit basically says, hey, whoa, choose. You know I can't change this. But um, just between you and me, I probably wouldn't notice if you sort of got together and made sure there wasn't anyone left who wanted to enforce it. You know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And that's how everyone in Haman's family, plus 75,000 other people who more or less didn't like the Jews at all, are wiped out in the course of two days. And today, in remembrance of all that, the Jewish people still celebrate Purim. Which is something we talked about in December during our gifts episode. The point is, though, Esther's real name, her Hebrew name, Hadassah? Scholarship suggests that it translates to the word myrtle, meaning the myrtle tree, of the family Myrtacea. A family of plants that includes such delightful trees as the bay rum tree, the clove, the allspice, and the eucalyptus. In fact, as part of the preparations for marrying the king, Esther would have been bathed daily in such spices and scents for months at a time. Which is fitting, considering that one of the chief uses for esters, the chemical compound, is to make artificial scents and flavors for perfume and food. Thanks for all your support for the show. We'll see you next time.